All right, guys, ready to get started on the wonderful world of ILD? Yep. Cool, you guys seem pumped. Let's do this. So, I'm going to talk to you for the next half an hour or so about interstitial lung disease, which is my particular area of interest. Um, and I think from a pulmonary perspective, I don't know that you guys get a lot of exposure to it on the inpatient or necessarily the outpatient side of things. Correct me if I'm wrong. No? Cool. It's going to be fun. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk for the most part about ILDs. I'm going to touch very, very briefly on anatomy because I know it's everybody's favorite um, subject, but it's actually very important in an interstitial lung disease specialty, more so, and don't tell the other guys, than I think airway disease because it's a little bit more complicated. But for the most part, um, we'll touch very briefly on anatomy. And then for the most part, I'm going to be talking to you about interstitial lung disease and IPF in particular because it's the most common of the interstitial lung diseases. Okay, so what are the ILDs? Anybody want to give it a go? You can literally read it off the screen. No? Okay. So it's essentially anything that is not an airway disease, okay? So if it's not emphysema, if it's not pulmonary hypertension, so vascular disease, everything that happens within the lung parenchyma itself is considered an interstitial lung disease. So it's a huge, a huge category. And within that, we further classify into different things, including idiopathic lung diseases, so unknown, and then things like connective tissue-related lung disease, occupational-related lung disease, all of those things come under the big umbrella of interstitial lung disease. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to give you a brief kind of broad overview of ILDs and then focus on IPF because, like I said, it's the most common. And so if you think about anatomically, you're getting right, right down to the very distal airways and your alveolus and the membrane between your alveolus and your capillaries or capillaries, however you say it. And um, that interface is where the disease is happening. And it's there that you're starting to get pathology that ultimately goes on to cause the interstitial lung diseases. So like I talked about, there are multiple types of ILDs. Idiopathic interstitial pneumonias known as IIPs. Granulomatous diseases. Anybody think of a granulomatous interstitial lung disease? I'm going to start picking on you if you don't answer. There we go, sarcoidosis. Okay, and then occupational lung diseases. Silicosis, coal workers, pneumoconiosis, right? We're right in the middle of Kentucky for that. Drug-induced lung diseases, name a drug. Amiodarone, strong. Okay, cystic lung disease. <laughs> this is a much rarer, but things like um, Langerhans cell histiocytosis is a cystic lung disease. Um, LAM is a cystic lung disease. So there's a few of them. So it's really important to try with ILD because it's such a big topic to find ways to break it down or to categorize them. So the first one is granulomatous lung disease, which you guys mentioned. Sarcoidosis is probably the most known, but there are a few more. And then what you do is break them down into granulomatous and non-granulomatous lung diseases. And then within that, things that have a known cause and things that have an unknown cause. So actually, uh, sarcoidosis is a granulomatous disease of unknown etiology. We don't know what causes it. Versus, and we'll talk a little bit about, about sarcoid, but hypersensitivity pneumonitis is also a granulomatous lung disease. But we tend to know that that is an intrinsic allergic reaction in the lung to something in the environment, whether it's um, something that you work around, birds and avian antigens are the most common, fungal infections can also cause a hypersensitivity type picture. So we tend to know the cause of those. And the reason they're called granulomatous lung disease is because you have granulomas. Um, let's see if this works. Um, you have granulomas on your histopathology, okay? Um, the difference between the two is just the size and the density of the granuloma and obviously the cause that we uh, try and track down. And then collagen vascular disease causes non-granulomatous lung disease. So common diseases include scleroderma, which causes lung disease, lupus, which has lots of pulmonary manifestations, um, rheumatoid, you can get rheumatoid lung. Um, and then lastly, the idiopathic pneumonias, which is what I'll focus on today. So they are non-granulomatous and we don't know what causes them, okay? So I think I touched upon this very briefly, but essentially where we're looking at pathology is that the space between your alveolar epithelial cells and your blood vessels, they share a common basement membrane. And that's where your gas exchange is taking place. When you start getting disease and pathology, you start getting um, 
extra cellular matrix gets broken down and layered up there. So you start getting a thicker surface area for diffusion. You start getting the um, uh, scar tissue being put down and fibrosis in that area. So if you think about that clinically, the types of symptoms you're going to be seeing are hypoxia related because your gas transportation is being affected. So that's why these patients have a lot of dyspnea um, and are usually hypoxic because their initial presenting symptoms. But ultimately, it is happening at, I don't think there's a pointer here, but what you're looking at up top is the uh, layer of your um, alveolus. And then this is a blood vessel with RBCs in it. And it's that very small area in between where the disease is taking place. It's not exclusive to that area. The, the fibrosis can continue to track up and around the airways. But for the most part, that's what's happening. It's destruction of that basement membrane and increased scarring is taking place there. With me so far? All right. So the idiopathic pneumonias are heterogeneous. They're obviously unknown etiology, the most common one being IPF. And it's essentially just fibrosis and thickening that is happening in that area, which is ultimately leading to, the, to disease. So... The most common one is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and actually there was a grand rounds on IPF, I think, many months ago. But there are other types of idiopathic pneumonitis or uh, interstitial diseases. Um, AIP is also called Hammond rick syndrome. I don't know if you guys have ever heard about that. It's very rapid, dec uh, rapid decline, fibrotic disease, very poor prognosis. NSIP, or nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, is exactly that. It's just inflammation and scarring of that area of the lung. We don't really know what causes it and doesn't have a specific pattern. And then smoking-related lung disease. So a common misconception is that all smokers can only get COPD or emphysema, but actually you can get fibrosis of those airways very distally, and you can get fibrosis of your alveoli, and that can lead to smoking-related uh, fibrosis. It's called SRIF, smoking-related interstitial fibrosis. And that's broken down into those various subtypes. And then things you may have heard about, organizing pneumonias, uh, LIP or lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. So as you can see, within ILD, there are multiple subheadings. And then within those subheadings, there's just more and more subheadings. And that's what makes ILD so complicated. Yes. It's affecting, so your interstitium is your um, wall around your alveoli, the basement membrane in between, and then the external wall of your blood vessel. So those structures together are your interstitium for the most part, and disease is happening anywhere along there. So that's one of the biggest things about the ILD is the nomenclature is, can get pretty confusing. But pneumonitis, pneumonias, they're all the same, um, or they're interchangeable in the ILD world. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the pathogenesis very briefly. But we don't know what causes the idiopathic form of these ILDs, but we speculate that there's some insult or injury somewhere that happens we assume it's an inhalation injury. We don't know if it happens right before you become unwell or if it happens way earlier and over years, you start to develop a, a pneumonia, a pneumonitis. Um, but we think that that triggers a cascade of inflam inflammation, which then goes on to recruit inflammatory cytokines and start to lay down this fibrosis picture. And if you follow along here up on your top left, is a health, healthy alveolar cell. We think some form of injury occurs and this recruits inflammatory cytokines, which I won't bore you with, but that ultimately then um, causes things like fibroblasts to come to the area to try and repair the damage. And they do that, for the most part, they can result in healthy repair. But in these diseases, you're getting dysregulated repair, and they start to lay down increased collagen, which thickens the basement membrane and leads to scar formation. Once you have scarring down there, you're no longer taking part in gas exchange. Your alveoli aren't opening and expanding and like they should be, they become stiff, and your lungs become shrunken, stiff, and essentially not functioning. Okay, so in the ILDs, oh, um, for the most part, the other thing that makes them a little tricky is they all tend to present roughly the same way. Um, so very common symptoms that you see in almost any type of pulmonary disease, not just the ILD world. Most notably, it's a triad of dyspnea on exertion that has been chronic, slow, insidious over time. A chronic dry cough is another common symptom. Um, and uh, your physical exam finding is usually crackles on exam. So not very specific and quite subtle. And that's one of the reasons that these patients tend to present to pulmonary so late because it takes years of figuring out what's causing these. They get a cardiac workup. They get an infectious workup. But ultimately, that nonspecific triad, usually you want to be thinking about an ILD, okay? 
Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the type of testing. But in some cases, you can have very nonspecific x-rays, nonspecific CAT scans. Okay, so they're always bilateral, so both lungs are always equally affected. You have to rule out an infectious etiology. In very few cases is this because of an infection. Um, they tend to be chronic diseases, so um, this remodeling of the lung takes place over years, usually. These patients have symptoms for a very long time. But they do have acute flare-ups throughout their disease, and that's important to treat and to recognize because the flare-ups can further exacerbate the fibrosis and can make you become pro-fibrotic. So we try and recognize acute flare-ups. Um, for the PFTs, you're going to look at a restrictive picture on your PFTs, and we'll look at some of those. And then like we talked about, gas transfer is going to be the issue. So you're always going to see a reduced DLCO if you guys are looking at PFTs, you'll see that. Uh, so I think we talked about the physical exam findings. It's usually a non-productive cough. So if your patient's saying, I'm coughing all the time, I'm bringing up a ton of mucus, it's usually not an ILD. These patients are not are having scarring and friction rubbing, essentially, which is causing the cough. It's not a productive cough. Um, usually no fever. Um, and like we talked about, the PFT findings already. So on your PFTs, you're going to see restriction because your lungs have become stiff and scarred. They shrink down, which is the opposite to your obstructive lung diseases where they kind of expand. So you're going to get shrunken lungs. So you'll see decreased lung volumes, if you guys are looking at PFTs, decreased DLCO, um, and decreased compliance. If you ever see these patients in the ICU, they're very difficult to ventilate because their lungs are so stiff. They just don't move. Um, a common... Uh, analogy is a little bit like a sponge so your lungs should be like a sponge and soft it's like a dried up sponge you can't twist it you can't bend it they don't move and that's one of the symptoms that you'll see in the ICU with ventilation and in the PFT you'll see restriction okay so bronchoscopy you think all pulmonologists like to bronch our patients but actually there's a lot of data in the ILD world that bronchoscopy is unhelpful in interstitial lung disease um, so these lungs are extremely sensitive to environmental changes. Sedating a patient, putting them on oxygen, putting a uh, bronch down into their airways actually triggers inflammation. And a lot of these patients will do worse with intervention to their lungs. Um, a little bit like pulmonary hypertension patients, we try and keep them away from anything that can trigger the inflammation in their lungs. So we try not to bronch them. We try not to give them too much oxygen. We never intubate pulmonary fibrosis patients. They should all be a do not intubate. We don't like them to have elective surgeries because that can exacerbate them, keep them away from viruses, infections, anything like that that could just trigger this inflammation and an acute exacerbation. Having said that, some of the non-idiopathic type of ILDs, a bronchoscopy can be a little helpful. So, for example, to rule out an infection, you may need to do a BAL and make sure nothing grows. If you're worried about an underlying malignancy before you diagnose them, then it's helpful. In sarcoidosis, where they have lots of adenopathy, you want to make sure it's not a cancer, it can be helpful. But if you're fairly sure this is an idiopathic lung disease, for the most part, bronchoscopy is not going to help. Instead of a, a bronchoscopy, bronchoscopic biopsy, if we absolutely have to get tissue to make the diagnosis, which in most of the ILDs you do, um, then we prefer a surgical lung biopsy. A transbronchial biopsy takes pieces that are too small. They cannot be seen under the microscope, and they cannot get the pathology that you need to look at to make a diagnosis. So they end up having to go for a surgical biopsy, if you need a biopsy. Okay, so let's look at some of this stuff on imaging. So chest x-rays. What do you guys think of this x-ray? Hyperexpanded? Okay. What if we compare it to these x-rays? So normal chest x-ray, as is written. And then a pulmonary fibrosis x-ray, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just checking you're all still with me. Um, so as you look at the chest, the chest x-ray on this side is, is normal. It is a little hyperexpanded, I will give you that. But for the most part, you're not seeing any dense consolidation. If you compare it to the other two, you just get this very nonspecific reticulations, maybe scarring um, on the top one. The bottom one, you can see it even a, a little more. Lungs are, are shrunken, so smaller because of the scarring. But a chest x-ray is relatively unhelpful in ILDs. It's not a specific finding. You can't definitively say what's going on there. And so the image choice for ILD is a high-resolution CAT scan. So not a regular CAT scan, a high-resolution CAT scan. It gives you much better resolution, obviously, so that you can see the detail and the scarring. Um, and a lot of the ILDs, and in particular idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, is a radiographic diagnosis. You, make, you can make that diagnosis just from a CAT scan. 
So you want to have a good CAT scan, good quality, and you want to um, look for the certain things, the criteria that make it an IPF diagnosis. When you do a high-risk CAT scan, and you, if you order them here or at the clinic, there's a protocol in place, but they do a full inspiratory and take the picture, a full expiratory and take a picture. They prone you and take a supine image as well. So it's a pretty extensive CAT scan. And that's just because you want to make sure that, for example, if you've taken a breath out, your lungs have collapsed, and you take a CAT scan, you want to make sure that that's just lung collapse and there's no scarring hidden in those areas. Then you take a full breath in to open up the lung and reshoot the picture and make sure that the scarring isn't really there. And then you prone them and supine them so that the dependent portions of your lungs that are collapsed when you're on your back open up when we flip you over. So again, you can get detail of the posterior parts of the lung. So it's a protocol that they have at U of L and I think at most big institutions. Very briefly circling back to some anatomy, but the yellow outline here is what's called a secondary lobule. And this is, this is a, a functioning unit of the lung. So it's a, a, both an airway, all of your vessels go into the center of this lobule, and then there's a um, basement membrane, healthy basement membrane around the sides of it. You can actually see these on a CAT scan. So the reason that it's important to know what they are is because you can see them on a CAT scan, and in fibrosis, the yellow line becomes scarred and thick. So if you can see individual lobules on a CAT scan, there's, the, there's been some scarring and some thickening there, and that's an abnormality. So um, I'll show you some CAT scans of some fibrosis, and you'll be able to see each individual lung unit, which you shouldn't be able to see in a healthy lung. So this slide is a little busy, but I think it's important for you guys, especially in the outpatient world, when you're seeing patients with pulmonary symptoms. So an HMP is important in obviously everything that you do, but it's particularly important in the ILD world because if you cannot find an inciting event that's caused the fibrosis, you're calling it idiopathic. Idiopathic disease has a completely different set of treatments and a completely different prognosis and overall mortality. So you really have to dig and hunt into the patient's history to try and find a cause to change the treatment and the course for this patient, for your patients. Um, and because fibrosis happens over decades, you want to go back decades with your history. So it's a very, very detailed history and physical. And you're asking things about their work, their jobs, their exposure history. Have they been around pets, cats, birds, dogs, molds? Are they welders, coal workers, flower workers, cheese millers, whatever it is that they did in the last 20 to 30 years? Because you want to try and find a trigger. And if you can't find one, then you can call it idiopathic. And then they go down a different pathway here, if you can see. So if you think they're idiopathic, so on this side, then you get your CAT scan. And depending on your CAT scan findings, you can either make a radiographic diagnosis of IPF down on this side. And if not, then for the most part, you're getting a biopsy and it's going to give you any other diagnosis that's idiopathic, of which there are several. Does that make sense? Yeah? Great. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, the last half of this is IPF. So IPF is by far the most common of the idiopathic type of interstitial lung disease, right? Interstitial lung disease, idiopathic kind, IPF is your most common. There's several more, but IPF is really the one that you're trying to diagnose because this, like I said, is most common. It has its own dedicated set of treatments that we'll talk about, and it has a very poor prognosis. So you're either trying, you're essentially trying to not give your patient this diagnosis. But if you have to, then you want to be absolutely certain that this is what they have, or close to certain. Okay, so we said it's the most common. It's Progressive fibrosis, we think it happens over many, many years. So by the time they're reaching your clinic or certainly my clinic, they've had symptoms for up to seven or eight years. And that's important when you talk about prognosis. Prognosis of IPF is about seven years. So if it takes them five years to get to you and then another year to get to me, there's really not much you can offer those patients. So it's really important to try and make this diagnosis early. It occurs for the most part in the older population, so 50 to 55 is very unusual, but that's where the cutoff starts. You're usually seeing it in the over 65 to 70 years of age. It's more common in men than women, but obviously it can be seen in both. And things that make you think about it are a history of smoking. It's more common in ex-smokers versus your COPD emphysema is in current active smokers. Um, 
It's common in patients who have a history of reflux because we think they have a long-standing history of micro-aspirating and that acid falls back into the lung. It's not clinically noticeable, but it can cause some scarring and fibrosis. And then if they grew up in their earlier years with chronic viral infections, there's been some association with that leading to IPF in the future. Very rarely it's familial. So if you have two patients, two members of a family with IPF, then that's definitely genetic. And that's important to know because there's lots of research looking at different therapies for, for genetic interventions for this particular patient population. But not a lot of cases are genetic. We talked a little bit about the features already. So dry crackles, um, which you'll hear on exam, and then clubbing. A lot of these patients have clubbing. By the time they get to me, they usually have clubbing. So, and I'm sure by the time a lot of them get to you, they will. So one of the most confusing things about ILD, and I'm just going to relate it to IPF, is diagnosis. And, I'm, and um, I'm sure you've seen this when you've ordered CAT scans. So how you work down the algorithm is you get your patient, you do your extensive history and physical, you get your CAT scan. When you get your CAT scan, they will read it. They won't say IPF. They will say it has a pattern that is called UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia. That phrase is IPF until proven otherwise. That is the radiographic finding that you're trying to see on CAT scan. If they have certain criteria, it's called a UIP pattern on CAT scan. And if they have that, you want to start ruling out other things and other causes. And if you don't find any causes, then that patient essentially has IPF, okay? So what is a UIP pattern? Anybody know? No? No speed readers? Honeycombing? Okay. So there's three big things that are UIP pattern if you see them on CAT scan. The first is reticular fibrosis. So it's sort of, well, I'll show you some pictures, but... Um, just very nonspecific reticular scarring of those lobules that we talked about that happen along the sides and the bases of your CAT scan. So if it's all in one particular area, it's usually not UIP. It's usually along the sides and the bases. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is honeycombing. Honeycombing, you, will, you should see to call it UIP. It usually demonstrates end stage or progressed disease because that means your lung is scarred over. But that again, you see at the bases and along the sides of the CAT scan. And the last thing is something called traction bronchiectasis. So if you imagine your airways, the, the membranes of them are becoming scarred, it pulls those airways apart and it looks like tram tracks. You guys remember that whole tram tracking thing from step one? <laughs> yeah. So it's sort of that picture on a CAT scan. So those three things, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, and this reticulations along the sides and the bases, that's called a UIP pattern. If you see UIP pattern after you order a CAT scan, that's typically IPF until proven otherwise, okay? It's a radiographic diagnosis. Most ILD specialists and radiologists are comfortable making that diagnosis. They've done studies. You get it right about 96% of the time, unlike other ILDs, which are much harder to, to pinpoint just from a CAT scan. But IPF, you can usually get off of a CAT scan, okay? Things that you should not have. So if you see any of the following... Ground glass, which is that hazy looking CAT scan, it's not UIP and therefore it's not IPF. If you have a lot of nodules all over, it's not IPF. If you have what's called mosaic attenuation, which I'll show you pictures of, it's just changes in the CAT scan between breathing in and they take a picture and breathing out and they take a picture. If there's a change, one looks darker or lighter than the other, then that signifies airway disease, that you couldn't breathe, take a proper breath in or out. If you see anything like that, it's not UIP. And then we talked about your pulmonary function test, so your restrictive pattern. So your FEV1, FEC should be above 70%, but your vital capacity and your FEV1 will be reduced, so less than 80 typically, okay? And for IPF and IRDs in general, unlike airway disease, the FVC is what we follow versus COPD. You're usually looking at your FEV1, okay? So we look at your forced vital capacity. That's the volume to show how shrunken or stiff your lungs have become, okay? So we talked about high CT findings. Essentially, in the clinic for ILD, we talk about UIP pattern that's definitive, and then we 100% tell that person they have IPF. You can have some of the features of those things, with other features that make it a little harder to, to definitively make that diagnosis. 
and then that's called probable or indeterminate UIP, and that should prompt you to do further testing, usually a biopsy. But if you get the one on the left, UIP, you don't have to do anything else. If they read it as probable or indeterminate, then they're not quite sure and you're not quite sure. And before you give that person that kind of diagnosis and prognosis, you should do some other testing, okay? Okay, so this is the reticular patterns. So I don't know if you can, you guys can see that well? It's come up okay. So it just doesn't look right is the first thing. And there's lots of thickened white lines everywhere. That's your intralobular septum. I don't have a pointer, so I don't think I have a pointer. No, I'm going to show you. So can you see these sort of white lines with almost outlining the small globules? They shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be able to see those. So if you can, there's been some fibrosis, some scarring, okay? So this is what's called a reticular pattern. It's all along the edges and along the bases of the lung. This is honeycombing. So honeycombing is a little harder to detect compared to cysts, but honeycombing, again, along the bases, they're very thin-walled, and they usually stack up on top of each other. So you want a couple on top of each other before you call it uh, honeycombing. Otherwise, cysts are just single little cysts all over the lung. So this is called honeycombing. And again, it's along the sides and the bases. This is pretty advanced disease, but that's the honeycombing that you're looking at. And then traction bronchiectus, this is not the greatest picture of traction bronchiectus, but if you can see the airway, so those dark black circles are dilated and big, and they're starting to traction off. I can't reach that high, but there's one up top <laughs> over there, and there's a couple over here, traction bronchiectus. Can you see that, sort of? So they are three things to call this a UIP pattern, to call this patient IPF. And this is a little bit of everything, so reticular changes along the edges, some honeycombing, and a little bit of traction. Okay, so UIP on your high res CT, a radiologist has called you and said this patient has UIP, and you have to think, well, does that mean they have IPF? For the most part, yes, but you do. There are very, there are a couple of other diseases that can give you a UIP pattern that you have to rule out to call this idiopathic. The most common is rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis of the lungs can give you a UIP pattern. So every patient, you get a CAT scan that says UIP, you want to send off an RA an RF, sorry, and a CCP to so rule out rheumatoid disease. Um, and then asbestosis, you can usually get from their history. So you want to rule those out. Chronic hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, is much harder to differentiate between the two, so I won't bore you with it. But definitely rule out rheumatoid, definitely rule out other work-related, in particular, asbestosis. So with that being said, when your patient comes and they get the CAT scan and it shows UIP, this is a starter pack of blood tests you want to run. So you're ruling out um, a CBC is going to give you a differential. So any high eosinophils is going to make you think more about an allergic type of reaction that's happening in the lungs or an infectious type. Um, renal disease to rule out vasculitis, which can sometimes cause some pulmonary fibrosis and scarring. ESR, CRP, just inflammatory markers, which if they're elevated, you want to do more of an autoimmune workup. But you're usually doing a full autoimmune workup on these patients to rule out diseases that can look like this such as rheumatoid that we talked about, scleroderma can do it, Sjogren's can do it, and closing spondylitis can do it. So a lot of the rheumatologic diseases can give you this pattern. So you have to rule out all known causes of UIP and have a UIP picture to call this IPF. With me? If you do that, if you have your UIP pattern, but they read it as atypical or indeterminate or not quite sure, or you get a blood test and you have a very mildly weakly positive ANA and you're not quite sure what it means, then usually you want to go and do more invasive testing, which in these patients we talked about is a surgical lung biopsy. When you do a biopsy, they'll take the tissue, the pathologist will look at it, and he will look for, or she, will look for specific things on the pathology that they will also call UIP. They will call it UIP on pathology or histopathology. So if you see the letters UIP on either CAT scan or on the piece of tissue when they read it, you're usually looking at an IPF diagnosis. To have UIP on pathology, you have to have something called fibroblastic foci, just areas of fibroblasts, so scarring, in a particular distribution on histopathology is, called, is, is consistent with an IPF diagnosis. And in between these diseased areas, you have to have areas of normal lung.
Unlike other ILDs, IPF attacks in a heterogeneous way, so there's diseased lung next to healthy lung that have these foci. If they see that on a slide, they'll call that UIP, and that is also another way to get to your diagnosis of IPF, okay? Um, most other ILDs are a diffuse pattern, so the whole piece of tissue will have disease or abnormalities in it, whereas this is heterogeneous. And these are the fibroblastic foci. So this is just collagen deposition. Um, these white spaces are normal of areas of normal lung, and next to them is areas of these fibroblasts, um, which should not obviously be there. Okay, treatment for IPF. You guys know how to treat IPF? Transplant? Yep. A little aggressive, but sure. <laughs> it's definitely the, an option, yeah. So there's been three big trials looking at treatment for IPF, and I'll, I'll blast through these. A long time ago, we used to use steroids, azathioprine, and NAC. The combination therapy was heavily used and thought to be great. They did a big trial on it in 2012, and actually they had to stop the trial early because those being treated had a higher risk of mortality. They were dying sooner and having more exacerbations. So it was terminated, and it completely changed the way that we treated and looked at IPF. Um, there is some data looking at just NAC by itself, but it's not been particularly promising, and we've not really gotten anywhere with it. In 2014, two big studies came out. The Impulses trial, which looked at Nintendonib. You may have heard of it. It's called OFEV. No. <laughs> the, the brand name is OFEV. The chemical name is Nintendonib. It is an uh, antifibrotic therapy that they tested, and it, what it does is it slows down your reduction in your force vital capacity. So that's why we monitor the FVC on PFTs when we see these patients. None of the therapies for IPF are curative. It is not a curative disease. It is a managed disease. So we can slow down how much it progresses, but we can't cure it. So this medicine slows down the progression, and we monitor that progression by the FVC on PFTs and the DLCO. And this study showed that there was a reduction in how much you lose your force vital capacity. So 115 mLs in the treatment group versus 250. So statistically significant, but not great. But it's all that we have. Um, this medicine, you take it once, one pill, twice a day. You guys shouldn't be prescribing it, but if you see people on it, just be aware that it's a, it's a medication for the IPF. It causes very severe gastroenteritis that is not dose dependent or duration dependent. So you can be on the drug for years and then develop it. You can get it as soon as you start the therapy. It also can cause hepatotoxicity and renal toxicity. So these patients get labs every three months, two to three months. They get PFTs every four to six months and six minute walk tests at the same time. Uh, things that you should know about this medicine is it interacts with a lot of anticoagulants. So it can increase things like Coumadin and a, a lot of the NOACs. So before you put a patient on it, if they're on this, you want to just make a call and make sure that you know that those two interact. They interact with a lot of things, but they definitely interact with anticoagulants. The second uh, trial was uh, a different medicine, profenadone, also called Esbriet, um, which we use. They, it does about the same thing. They came out literally weeks apart, these two studies. So um, this drug also reduces the decline in your FVC but it also improved how far they could walk on a six-minute walk test. Not a lot, but enough that it was significant. The difference between the two is really a conversation with your patient. This causes a pretty significant photosensitivity. So if your patient's an outdoorsy kind of person, sensitive skin, this is not the medicine for them. The other one may be better, vice versa. This is three times a day. The other one's twice a day. So again, it just comes down to patient preference. They've both roughly shown to do the same thing. Uh, benefits of the other medicine, they believe that an exacerbation, it reduces the number of exacerbations with OFEV. This didn't show that, but this did show that it reduces, um, if you combine it with steroids during the exacerbation, they do better. So there's some very subtle nuances between the two, but for the most part, it's just a patient preference, and um, they both cause liver problems, and they both cause kidney problems, and they both require the same follow-up blood work every few months, PFT, six-minute walk test. But that's it. They're the only two drugs currently on the market. They're specialty prescribed. They cost a fortune, and not everybody qualifies for them. But if you see your patients on these medicines, they have an IPF diagnosis. They looked at multiple other things in the past have been studied, and they've all failed, so none of this stuff works. Other things that you should be doing for your patients who have IPF is a lot of them need long-term oxygen therapy. They have diffusion issues. 
treatment of the cough. So the cough is their most significant complaint. So whilst they're dyspneic and having other issues, cough is usually their biggest complaint. It has the, and it's their biggest complaint because it affects their day to day. They can't go out. They can't go to the movies, go to dinner. People think they have a cold, the flu, they're infectious. It's a lot of stigma and they really struggle with this. So we're very aggressive about treating cough. We start anything from the over counter to the therapies all the way up to the latest trend is things like gabapentin and Lyrica because it's a nerve cough. It's a triggered nerve as opposed to an infection. So we use things like gabapentin, Lyrica um, to try and stop the, the trigger of the cough. And then other things, most patients with IPF should be on a PPI or some kind of antacid to prevent any aspiration and acid falling down into their lungs that could worsen their fibrosis. And then you want to do an echo on these patients every couple of years just because the hypoxemia can result in pulmonary hypertension, which can, is a severe comorbidity and will worsen their mortality. And then this, I think, is important for you all to know as well. So IPF is a slowly progressing disease, and it has acute exacerbations. It's not a gradual thing. Once you have an exacerbation, your pulmonary function tests dive off a cliff. You lose a lot of lung function when you have an exacerbation. It doesn't happen in a lot of patients, but it's enough that it's significant. You can lose up to 20 to 30% of your lung function every time you have an exacerbation, and it does not recover. So they can be fine one day, exacerbate the next, and find themselves on 10 liters of oxygen between those two days, and it's not recoverable. Nobody knows what causes the exacerbations, and we don't have any good treatments for it other than the two medicines that we just talked about. If you have an exacerbation, your survival is, is changes significantly. About um, You have about three to four months of survival post-exacerbation. So we're very aggressive about trying to prevent exacerbations and trying to treat them if you do have them. Things that we don't do for these patients when they become super hypoxic and in the hospital and on 100% FiO2, we do not intubate these patients. It makes them worse. It exacerbates their exacerbation, and they usually die during the intubation period. So much like your pulmonary hypertension patients, IPF patients, we do not intubate. Things that you can try, there's no data, but we, we do it anyway, is steroids, because steroids fix everything. <laughs> And antibiotics, if you think they have an infectious etiology. But for the most part, there's no good data. They've looked at various things, hemoperfusion, dialysis, to remove these inflammatory cytokines. Um, starting some of the medicines we talked about, the OFEB or the ESBRIOT during the acute exacerbation. Nothing's really been massively significant that we currently use. Some things in trial have shown an improvement in outcome, um, such as the polymyxin or the recombinant human thrombomodulin, but it's not standard of care just yet. It's all experimental. And then, like you mentioned, lung transplant. So that part's really important for you guys to be aware of for several reasons. Criteria for lung transplant is a lot, and I know it's cumbersome, but you guys see a lot of COPD and emphysema and, and all those types of diseases. And as they get sicker and sicker, you refer them to us or to transplant. It's very slow, it's very progressive, and you usually have time. IPF, not so much, because as soon as they have an exacerbation, which you don't know when they're going to have it, they have about three months to live. And that is not enough time to get worked up and put on a lung transplant list, get matched, get transplanted. And if they become too sick or too oxygen dependent, they're not a candidate for transplant because they're too sick to survive the surgery. So it's much harder to know when to transplant or send these patients. What they recommend is... If you've had a change in your DLCO or your FVC by 10% between your two visits, you should refer them then. So that includes if you go from an FVC of 50 down to 40, you get a transplant referral. And if you go from an FVC of 100 down to 90, you get a transplant referral. So it's not the raw number, it's how much they're declining. Because once you start to decline, you keep declining every few months. You don't just get to 90 and stay. You're going to keep dropping every few months. And so we refer these patients very early. Usually as soon as I make the diagnosis, they also get a transplant consult. So they don't spend a lot of time with me. So the other indication is if the PFTs are staying stable, but they develop pulmonary hypertension on an echo, you refer those patients for transplant as well. These patients do better, actually, with transplant than other patients because they're not cachectic, emaciated COPD is, they're not still smoking, they've not got other issues going on. Such a rapid onset when they start to exacerbate that they do a little bit better. And these patients are older, 
then your COPD patients. So you don't want to wait too long and they age out of being able to be transplanted. U of L um, doesn't quite have an age limit, but it's, it's around 70, 75. Um, and so you kind of want to keep that in mind if you see your diagnosis patients. Um, trying to think. And we already talked about prognosis. So this, the bottom um, line is patients with UIP, which is IPF in this case, versus patients with what fibrosis from other diseases, such as NSIP. If you look at the change in mortality, the outcomes, it's significant. These patients have about a 70% mortality in five years, which is worse than almost most lung cancers, except most cancers, except for lung cancer. <laughs> So this is, it's a, we call it a chronic malignancy. These patients don't do well. And a lot of that is because they're just not picked up early enough. And we don't have a lot of therapies to help them. But there's some stuff in the works. Um, that's it. That's my IPF and ILD spiel. Questions? Yes. PFTs, it depends. If they're on therapy, we usually see them every four months and repeat their PFTs because we'll do their labs as well at the same time as doing their testing. If they have been stable for about a year, we'll see them every six months. If they've had changes in their PFTs, we see them every three to four months is one thing. And the CAT scan is a good question. So your CAT scan and your biopsy are just for diagnosis purposes. It does not correlate with, uh, <laughs> doesn't correlate with severity of your PFTs at all. So you can have a lung that's densely fibrotic and relatively mild PFTs and vice versa. So we use the CAT scan to look for that UIP pattern and make the diagnosis or biopsy if we have to. And then we don't typically repeat their CAT scans. The exception being is IPF patients have an increased risk of lung cancer. So if they start telling you they're having some weight loss, night sweats, that kind of thing, then you can, then you should repeat a regular CT to look for masses, nodules, etc. Um, in some places, they will do repeat CAT scans every three to five years as cancer screening, but it's a high res, it's high dose uh, radiation, so we generally don't. So you don't need to do a CAT scan, but the PFTs and the six minute walk are done every four to six months. And then I think I had very quickly, so this is in the real life, not textbook. So it's a little harder to do in real life. So this is a UIP pattern on high-res CT. It's a little more subtle. I don't know if you can appreciate that compared to the ones that you find in a textbook. So it is along the edges, the disease. It's along the bases. So this one down here on the bottom is the honeycombing cysts that you can see. Uh, the traction bronchiectasis up here on your top right, you can see kind of a, a tram tracking of the airway. Um, and you don't see any ground glass, haziness, inflammation, not, not really a ton of anything else. So it's peripheral, it's basal, there's honeycombing, and there's tram tracking. That's a UIP on, on high-res CT. This is the same thing, but much more honeycombing, <laughs> much more fibrosis, much more scarring. So you can see this, the honeycomb cysts, they're usually roughly the same size. They stack up on top of each other. There's not a lot of inflammation with it. You can appreciate some of the tram tracking here and thickening of the fissures and in the interlobular sector. These are two patients from my clinic. Um, this patient was just referred for transplant. Obviously, he's doing much worse. Clinically, his PFTs, he has an FVC of about 70%. He's on 15 liters of oxygen. Versus this lady, her FVC is 45%. And she's on room air. <laughs> So your CAT scans, like I was trying to say, does not correlate with your disease severity. It just depends on, on the patient. Um, so the CAT scan is purely diagnostic. Your PFTs are for treatment and monitoring. And in fact, a lot of our patients, because they're older and they have a little more, a few more comorbidities, a lot of these patients tend to get a single lung transplant and do pretty well. It's less time on, in the OR, um, less anesthesia time, et cetera. So a lot of them will, they'll find... I'll do a perfusion study, see which lung has the best perfusion, and keep that one and, and take the other one out. And they generally do well. But if you keep a native, one of your lungs native, that lung can have exacerbations. But for the most part, they do. It doesn't recur. If you're referring, um, if you're referring, it's I guess it's just me. <laughs> then yeah, a cat. If you got a cat scan done first, it's helpful for me because. It's not wasting time. You can figure out the diagnosis almost because it's a radiographic diagnosis. You can do that almost there and then in the clinic and start talking about next steps and planning certain things. Um, if you have restriction on PFTs, as a general rule, a high-res CAT scan goes with restrictive PFTs. 
If you have non-restrictive but abnormal PFTs, then a regular CAT scan is, is fine if you need to get a CAT scan. But a restrictive pattern on PFTs is an interstitial lung disease until proven otherwise. And interstitial lung disease need a high-risk CAT scan. So that's much more helpful. You don't have to put anything special in the order. They do the whole proning and supine uh, images. Um, normal PFTs with a low DLCO, which you probably also sometimes see, you still want to get a high-res CAT scan because the DLCO is the first abnormality usually in ILD. You also want to tag an echo onto that patient because the only other thing that gives you that is pulmonary hypertension. Um, or very, very, very obese patients, but that's different. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you have a restrictive pattern, you want to get a high-res CT and then send them and we'll do the rest of the workup. So in the IPF patients, we'll treat them um, with a PPI, but we won't do any more advanced testing unless they're going to become transplant candidates or unless they want transplant, in which case the transplant team will do a full EGD and we'll look at their swallowing. Um, ILD in your connective tissue disease patients, we will do. So scleroderma patients will do it on because if they're having a lot of aspiration and it's worsening their fibrosis, then you can do a, an esophageal wrap or a Nissen's if you need to. Um, those patients usually aren't transplant candidates, so you're trying to find another way to prevent um, aspiration. And then a regular other aspiration treatment. But even if they're not having classical signs of heartburn, we treat ILD patients with a PPI usually for the most part. So life expectancy post-transplant uh, is not determined by, for the most part, your underlying initial lung disease that you had. So a COPD or an IPF uh, will have about the same. On average, it's about five years. On average, you have patients, we have patients who are 20 years post-lung transplant. We have patients that die six months post-transplant. So it averages out somewhere in the middle. But it's not dependent on what you had beforehand, unless you just did the one lung, right? Because then you can still have IPF exacerbations or COPD or that kind of thing. So it's not really dependent on that. Um, it depends on their immunosuppressive profile. So lungs are not matched, unlike other organs. They don't cross-match you with a donor, like they do with kidneys and hearts and almost everything else. Lungs are just taken because there's not enough of them. So um, if you can get your hands on a pair of lungs, then it goes in the patient that needs them. And so lung transplant patients are heavily immunosuppressed, lifelong, and a lot of the complications for the reason that they don't do so well comes from immunosuppressive and infections. Versus renal transplants, they come off of immunosuppression eventually, liver transplant, etc. So because we can't cross-match lungs, you need just suppress your immune system, but it doesn't depend on your underlying IPF. So I'd recommend if you have anything, anybody who has shortness of breath, restrictive pattern, CAT scan and send them to ILD. And the other thing is chronic cough. If you have a patient that's coughing, 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 you did all the stuff that you guys do and you can't get rid of it, PFT them and usually send them to ILD. It's usually one of the earliest signs of an underlying ILD. Cool. Thanks.